This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. studied our human rights masters together many years ago and then both became interested in indigenous people so at the same time so and she was just over the corridor so <laughs> so those were the only easy bit of the whole project the rest of it was then bringing all of our networks and, uh, and contributors together and trying to get all our on time etc and thinking about the various focus uh, elements to, you know, to, to, to bring to the book. It, it was tough, it was tough, but we got there in the end and it's, um, if, if you take out a small mortgage you could buy your own copy. Um, <laughs> but hopefully when it, uh, it, it turns into a paperback it could be more affordable. So, um, in terms of the coverage, I think we've, we've, we've achieved what we set out to achieve in terms of the thematic coverage. I think most of the big issues are in it, and I'm delighted about that, but I could easily say you could have several handbooks and still not cover the breadth of issues and concerns facing Indigenous peoples in the world today. So in many respects, you could say it's, it's, it's a beginning, and I'm hoping that more books will, will be produced that have a similar sort of thrust and coverage as this one, but you know, in an expanded way. So um, without further ado, I suppose I'll hand over to our, our first speaker tonight, which is not going to be Skype, I understand. Yes, okay, thanks, thanks, Damien. So we're, we're starting with the regions, and uh, we're due to have a speaker on Asia, uh, Raja Dhanushi Shwar, but he's not online yet, so <laughs> um, we'll keep our fingers crossed for that. Uh, in the meantime, I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Rachel Cedar, who's uh, visiting us. She's Senior Research Professor at the Center for Research and Higher Studies in Social Anthropology, CSS, at Mexico City. And she's also adjunct visiting professor at the Christian Mikkelsen Institute in Bergen, Norway, and research fellow at the Institute for the Study of the Americas at UCL. Her research interests cover indigenous and human rights, access to justice, and legal pluralism. And she's uh, published extensively on these topics, particularly with reference to Guatemala and Central America. She's visiting us uh, in the UK for a series of events, so this won't be the only chance you have to hear from her. Uh, but tonight she's going to speak to us about her chapter on Indigenous Peoples' Rights and the Law in Latin America. Thank you very much, Karen. Well, um, good evening. And uh, I'd like to thank both Karen and Damien very much for uh, the invitation to be part of this wonderful 
handbook, which I'm looking forward to getting my hands on a copy of soon, and just to salute the editors, because having done lots of editing work, I know that it's no mean feat to bring together this many chapters, and the book really looks splendid. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I will talk a little about Latin America then, which is a region that I work on and uh, live in, and just I was asked to map out some of the main findings um, of the chapters and to get my chapter and to signal some of the future areas for research that perhaps it signals. So I will do that. Um, in contrast to, to many other regions of the world where um, the acceptance of the notion of indigeneity or of indigenous peoples is much more problematic. That's not really the case for uh, Latin America. Most of the states of the region do recognize the existence of their indigenous or native populations and have slowly come to exist, uh, to accept, at least in, in theory, um, that they have a right to exist and that they have a right to some degree of what Rodolfo Stark and Hagen used to call internal self-determination um, within the boundaries of the nation state. Um, we also, of course, had nearly 30 years of constitutional reform in Latin America around multiculturalism, um, from the first Nicaragua uh, in the mid-80s, the kind of bulk of reforms in the 1990s, to be with this concept of Charlie Hales of neoliberal multiculturalism, um, through to the more recent plurinational uh, reforms in Ecuador 2008 and Bolivia uh, 2009. So we have had constitutional advances in recognition of indigenous peoples and their rights. It's called a mixed record. Um, it's important. In Bolivia, of course, indigeneity has become the language of the state um, with quite ambiguous um, Implications for indigenous peoples' collective rights, of course, when indigeneity becomes the language of the state, you end up pitching the interests of the state against minority indigenous uh, interests and peoples. Um, and there are many other countries, like Mexico, where I live, um, where multicultural reforms were quite weak um, or remain very weakly enforced. Um, the other thing maybe to say, um, which a lot of so social scientists were kind of looking at in the early days around constitutional reform, is whether there's any kind of correlation between size of population and strength of recognition, and that isn't borne out by the Latin American uh, example. Colombia, for example, has 3.4% indigenous population, but it has one of the strongest regimes of legal recognition uh, in the region versus Guatemala, where I also work on, which officially has uh, 40, around 40% indigenous population, has a very weak uh, regime of recognition and, and protection. Bolivia is maybe the exception. Uh, it's the largest percentage of indigenous population in any state in the region, uh, 62%. Uh, and that, the strength of uh, constitutional recognition reflects very much the strength of indigenous um, peoples in electoral politics. And that hasn't been the case across much of the rest of the region. Um, but overall, we also see trends of increases in the numbers of people who are self-identifying as indigenous in um, most countries in Latin America. Um, in terms of what to say about law, um, again, broad brush stroke comparisons with other regions in the world. Latin America is characterized by what uh, Rodriguez Pinero once called high porosity to human rights norms and institutions. Um, and that's because of the historical role that ideas about rights and citizenship have played in Latin America and the confirmation of its nation states, but also very much because of the strength of trans-regional human rights movements, uh, not just indigenous rights movements. We also think about the human rights movements at the time of the transition from authoritarian rule. Um, ideas of rights have been central to the politics uh, of the state and opposition in Latin America for decades. Um, Latin American states have been, um, in part because of that porosity or porousness to human, human rights norms, um, the, the states of the region have been global front runners in recognizing indigenous people's rights. Um, ILO, International Labour Organization Convention 169, was ratified by most countries in the region during the 1990s. Um, that's partly to do with the shift from authoritarian to democratic rule. They've ratified 
new, new tra transitional states ratifying just about every human rights um, convention out there in order to kind of affirm their democratic con con credentials, but also because of the mobilization of indigenous peoples around the 1992 centenary. Um, if we look at the region, the promise of prior consultation that was set out in ILO 169 really became a lightning rod for mobilization of indigenous peoples against the uh, extractive industries in their historic um, territories. Um, when I used to work in Guatemala in uh, the early 1990s, there was with indigenous mobilization against forced uh, participation in civil patrols and it was contested on constitutional grounds and people in the highlands used to bring out a constitution, pocketbook constitution, and now they bring out pocketbook ILO 169. Um, so ILO 169 uh, has been incredibly uh, important in the patterns of resistance. Um, but the extractivist models of economic development premised on exploitation of natural resources, oil, mining, uh, water, uh, timber, that's across the board. Uh, whether you have a multicultural, neoliberal, or a plurinational constitution. And indeed, uh, the government center left governments of Rafael Correa in Ecuador and Evo Morales in Bolivia have also faced mobilizations by indigenous people against uh, these kind of extractivist industries. Um, those patterns of development are, as I say, really common across the region. For example, more than 75% of the Peruvian Amazon is now leased effectively to the international oil industry. Um, and we've got more than 250 hydroelectric dams planned for development in the Amazon uh, region of Brazil alone, uh, despite lack of adequate environmental safeguards in most cases and lack of consultation with Amazonian indigenous people. So, what do you have? A mix. Ratification of ILO 169, new constitutions that say they respect indigenous people's rights, and concessions to extractive industries has led to increased judicialization of indigenous people's um, claims. Um, however, some places in high courts are less than receptive. When they are receptive and the judgment goes in indigenous communities' favor, um, they're frequently unenforced in practice. And if I was going to tag something for more research in the future, I'd say we definitely need more research on how the judiciaries in different countries frame and perceive indigenous people's claims. And also, uh, and this does happen, of course, what, what happens after a judgment is made you know, in terms of enforcement, so monitoring of key cases. Um, there are observatories in different parts of the region that are doing that kind of monitoring. Um, the existence of the inter-American human rights system has been of fundamental importance in the last 10 years um, in efforts to secure the enforcement of indigenous people's collective rights. Um, and that's a contrast again with other regions and the existence of the inter-American system, litigation uh, in the inter-American system means that you have a very dense network of lawyers, NGOs, um, litigating nationally under the system. And um, the UN Declaration became a point of reference in um, both the, the litigation of indigenous organizations and their allies, um, but also in the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court, even before 2007. So they were referring to it before 2007. How much more time have I got? Well, our uh, Asia uh, correspondent says he's not online, so <laughs> okay. I'll give another five minutes, yeah, we'll be fine. <laughs> I was going to talk a little about some of the key rulings in the inter-American system, um, which have begun to reflect some of the principles of the UN Declaration, um, particularly on rights to traditional land and state obligations to provide effective um, means for those traditional lands to be uh, delimited, demarcated, and titled. Um, and also say something about the jurisprudence of the court around rights to consultation and free prior informed consent. I'm not sure how much I'm talking to a room of lawyers who know all of the cases inside out. I'm not a lawyer, so um, forgive me if uh, that is the case. But I just will signal some of the key cases, which many of you might already know. Um, the first uh, key case was Agustini uh, versus the state of Nicaragua. That judgment in 2001 uh, developed an evolutionary, what's called an evolutionary interpretation. Article 20, not 21 of the American Convention um, of Human Rights, which refers to property rights. 
and it was um, such a signal judgment because it extended rights of property to the communal, communal property of indigenous peoples administered according to their own forms of law. Um, it also set down very important precedents about these obligations of, that states have to delimit, uh, demarcate and title collective indigenous <coughs> lands. And that's set out in ILO 169. Um, in the case of Agua's Pigmy, it was actually internal legislation uh, within Nicaragua, the uh, autonomy statutes of the Atlantic coast that had been um, decreed by constitutional reform, but they hadn't been acted on. So while those lands had been recognized, they hadn't been delimited or titled, and that was what, uh, and then the Nicaraguan government uh, gave a lot of concession in those lands, and that was what brought uh, the case to, eventually to the Inter-American Commission, but, and then to the Inter-American Court. But the court, uh, again, affirmed that states, if they recognize indigenous people's historical territories, they also have an obligation to demarcate them and title them, to make uh, effective um, those, those claims. Um, there are a group of um, cases um, of indigenous communities against the state of Paraguay um, in the mid-2000s, which also reinforced the rights to, of indigenous people to traditional land, and they make it, uh, important statements about the indivisibility between land and culture of indigenous peoples. Um, and again, reinform this idea that even though indigenous peoples don't maybe fit standard notions of property rights, communal property should be included within the protections extended by the inter-American system um, because of Article 21 of the American Convention. Um, two very important cases, just to not bore you with cases, um, but the Saramaka case and the Sarayaku case. Um, the Saramaka case versus Saramaka people versus Suriname, which was resolved in 2007, uh, which was about logging concessions in Suriname on indigenous lands. Um, again, here the court reaffirms the state's obligation to demarcate and title, um, but it also stipulated that consultations were important in order for that to occur. Um, and the Saramaka judgment is very important also because it said that natural resources were part of indigenous people's traditional territories. And that was the first time, I think, that um, in the judgment <coughs> court had said that. Another key issue of prior consent, which I know other people will be talking about this evening, um, but in, in this case, the court stipulated um, that the state was obliged not to adopt any measure without explicitly having the consent of the community, and that that consent should be obtained in accordance with their traditions and customs. So. The Saramaka judgment is very important because it sets down uh, uh, a standard of what is effective participation in consultation. Right? So it's not enough just to have consultation with indigenous peoples, um, but there, has to be, there have to be standards for how uh, those, the, that consultation is carried out. Um, and the ruling also specified the rights of the Saramaka people to give or withhold free prior and informed consent. So they're um, very much. Uh, it's a case that was um, resolved in November 2007 after uh, the UN uh, declaration is, is adopted. But as I said, the, the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court is referring um, to the UN declaration even in advance of its adoption. Um, but so the Saramaka people have the right to give or withhold free prior and informed consent. And then in its landmark judgment, the one that um, people have been studying inside out back to France since uh, 2012, is that of the Quechua indigenous people of Sarayaku versus the state of Ecuador, which was about oil concessions, which were granted on their land without their consent. And there the court analyzed developments in international norms and jurisprudence, and it concluded that the <coughs> obligation of states to consult with indigenous peoples is now a general principle of international law. Um, and in its ruling, what the court did is set out the minimum standards for free, prior, and informed consent. And those minimum standards are increasingly being cited in domestic cases, not just in Latin America, um, but elsewhere too. So what are they? Well, states have to actively consult, and they must inform. Um, 
they have to carry out consultations in accordance with the customs and traditions of the communities affected. So it's not enough just to turn up and say, here's a ballot box. We would like to consult you about whether you should have this logging in your land. Please vote. And that's not an adequate uh, consultation. Um, another stipulation is that consultations must be carried out in good faith. Um, very difficult to establish quite what good faith is in practice. Um, and that, that should occur through culturally adequate procedures with the express uh, purpose of reaching an agreement. Um, also, they stated consultation has to be carried out in the very first stages of the development uh, of um, a, a, a project or an investment plan. So not simply when you have to have the consultation, but that consultation should be built in from the very beginning. Um, and also, the, lastly, that states must ensure that the members of the people or a community are aware of the possible benefits and the risks of the proposed development. So, um, in terms of jurisprudence then, regional jurisprudence from the Inter-American Court, um, the courts established the indivisibility of in the protection of indigenous culture, territories, land, and natural resources um, through this reinterpretation of property rights. Um, it's also established again, time and again the obligation on states to delimit, title, and protect indigenous people's historic lands um, prior to extending concessions over those lands. So you can't promise that you respect historic title, not make effective that title, then issue <laughs> logging or oil concessions, and then want to consult the community about those concessions afterwards. <coughs> It's also set out um, standards of effective participation and or, uh, on free prior informed consent. Uh, to. So, just to conclude then, we've had lots of legal advances, um, but what have they actually meant in practice? Um, well, there's been a general lack of compliance, um, which has generated more conflict. Um, we see the persistence and in some cases the worsening of practices of violent displacement of indigenous peoples, um, targeted assassinations of indigenous t uh, peoples defenders, um, colonization of territories, more and more legal concessions, and illegal extraction also of um, natural resources. So for example, um, it's not just state actors, but non-state actors, paramilitaries, in places like Colombia playing an incredibly important role in illegal gold mining on ancestral territories of Afro-descendant uh, Afro and indigenous peoples. Um, expulsion of indigenous peoples from their land, lack of legal security, um, lots of targeting of um, socio-environmental activists. I guess everybody here saw the case of Bertha Cáceres, um, uh, the Lenka activist from Honduras who was killed for her resistance to hydroelectric dams um, in the west of Honduras, and that's one case that happened to um, hit the international headlines, but there are many, many, more than 75 um, indigenous rights defenders and socio-environmental cases killed in Colombia um, last year alone. Um, so there are also uh, national trends in some places towards trying to legislate consultation. Um, uh, but the tendency of states is to impose procedural and administrative logics on what consultation might mean uh, and to fall short of what the Inter-American Court set out in its minimum standards. Um, so Peru, for example, had a uh, law of consultation, uh, which was much heralded at the time of having had a reasonable process of consultation, um, but um, everything I've read since, um, maybe other people who know more about Peru can correct me, but um, it seems to be that it's been a mechanism for divide and rule of indigenous uh, communities. And these uh, large-scale projects continue without adequate prior evaluations or consultation. So there's a generalized failure in the region to meet international standards, although there have been notable advances in some countries. Um, Colombia is an interesting case. The jurisprudence of the Constitutional Court in Colombia contributed to some of these international standards that I've been talking about. 
um, there were nearly a thousand cases of indi about indigenous people's rights that went before the Colombian Constitutional Court in the first 10 years since the 1991 Constitution. And the court set out standards for uh, adequate prior consultation in 1997, so uh, 10 years before Sarajevo. Um, but there are still conflicts with executive actions, and there is still lack of execution of sentences in practice. Uh, Colombia is quite incredible in that there have been uh, more than 3,500 agreements on consultation to date. Um, the tendency is for indigenous communities to accept. I've seen some figures that say maybe three out of ten reject consultation and seven out of ten accept some form of agreement through consultation. Um, they take about a year and a half uh, and each process of consultation is ad hoc so there's no formula for uh, consultation apart from the general uh, principle but then some people say well it's an excess of consultas, right? Just thousands of, of processes of consultation. There's consultation on nearly every legislative and administrative measure, and yet the displacement of indigenous populations continues in many regions of the country. Um, okay, wrapping up, um, big issues that still continue to affect indigenous peoples in the region, well obviously poverty, uh, racism, discrimination, um, only about 11% of the whole population of the whole of Latin America is indigenous, um, but there are about 25% of the population that live in poverty, which is 40% of the whole population of the region, um, and they're even higher amongst those living in extreme poverty. More than half of Latin America's indigenous population live in urban areas, um, and there are very complex issues around rights protection in urban areas, um, different to issues about territorial, political, and legal autonomy. Um, issues maybe more around discrimination, access to services, exploitation, violence, violence in domestic service, violence against migrants. Um, so there's much more research needed to be done on rights protection for indigenous peoples within um, urban areas according to the international standards um, set out. There's also a lot of important recent research that I can't talk much about, but on gender justice and indigenous women's demands. Uh, within situations of communal autonomy, um, and particularly women's role in defense of territory. Um, so more research on that. There is a kind of growing nucleus of research in the region, but we need more uh, on gender and indigenous rights, and on children's <coughs> rights, uh, indigenous peoples and children's rights. That's something I, I often get asked for by students and, and uh, researchers, and there are very few things that I can recommend them to for the region anyway. So evidently, constitutional provisions without secondary legislation or coherent technical rules, uh, combined with economic development policies that conflict with measures of protection for indigenous lands, um, mean that proclamation of indigenous rights can often be just empty uh, promises. There's great lack of state control of third parties to ensure that indigenous people's rights to land and consultation are upheld in practice. Um, and I think what we're seeing from the region, uh, despite the positive legal reforms and jurisprudence that I've talked to you about today, uh, is that resistance uh, to indigenous claims on land and natural resources is only likely to become more entrenched um, in the forthcoming period. So, more research please on uh, new strategies around judicialization, um, on how the judiciary are responding, uh, what's the relationship between judicial and legislative responses in different countries, um, and also on the threats, of course, to indigenous people's livelihoods, their frames of those threats, um, and what kind of responses they are taking outside of uh, just perhaps resort to the courts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.